All right. Well, today we're going to finish up uh, with the reproductive system, and we covered the male reproductive system. Now, today we're going to look at the female reproductive system, and as we do that, I'm going to go into the next chapter just a little bit. It's all within this these notes, so you won't notice that I'm in the next chapter. But if you can't find this information in Chapter 22, just skip on over into Chapter 23 as you're studying at home, and you'll see it there. Okay. All right. If the primary organs for males are the testes, then, of course, the primary or organs, the counterpart organs in females are the ovaries because those are the organs that produce the sex cells, the eggs. And they also produce the hormones of the female reproductive system. Um, before a female child is born, while her ovaries are first developing, um, the ovaries develop two areas, a medulla, which is the inner part, and then a cortex, the outer part, sort of like with the kidneys and the adrenal glands. You have a cortex and a medulla. But in the cortex are groups of cells that are the cells that are going to undergo egg cell formation down the road. And uh, those groups of cells are, are the ovarian follicles. So in your lab, when you looked at the ovary through the microscope, you were looking at a lot of ovarian follicles. Okay. Um, so if you look at the sagittal, sagittal view, you can see that the ovaries are located right here um, in the upper pelvic cavity. And that's this is a sagittal view, so they're over at the sides. Of course, there's two ovaries, just like there's two testes. And the we're going to... In a little while, we're going to look at the rest of the organs, but right now we're just going to focus focus on the ovaries. On this slide, you can see a better view of their location. Do you see how they're they're within what's called the pelvic brim of the pelvic girdle? So there's one, and there's one. So they're well protected. There's lots of ligaments that you see: a broad ligament, an ovarian ligament, the round ligament. You're not going to have to learn any of these ligament names for me, okay? But um, sometimes um, if you've been pregnant, sometimes you've had issues with these ligaments. Sometimes early in pregnancy, they start stretching a lot, and it triggers some pain receptors. But um, it, can be, it can be pretty pretty serious pain for some women. Most women don't experience it, but some women really do, you know. Um, but anyway... As we look at the ovaries uh, and look at the process of egg cell formation, you tell me what was sperm cell formation? What was the name for that? S good, spermatogenesis. Egg cell formation is called, not that's not oogenesis, it's oogenesis, oogenesis. And in males, remember spermatogenesis began at puberty? And then continued every day. It went to completion every day from puberty till death. It may diminish a little bit as a man gets elderly, but he's producing sperm cells all the time. In females, the timing is very, very different for oogenesis than it is in spermatogenesis in males. In females, it actually starts during fetal development not at puberty. It starts at fetal development, and it begins with cells that are the counterparts to the spermatogonia. They're called oogonia, and those cells start oogenesis by dividing through mitosis and enlarging to form other oogonia, and then some of those specialize to form primary oocytes. Okay, so what I want you to do is stay on this page. I know I say that all the time. Stay on these pages, and let's let's look at at this development. Um, well, I tell you what, what I'd like to do. I think it would be better. Let me just put up a blank slide. Okay. So. Let's say here's an ovary in a little fetus. Okay? And let's say these cells right there in the cortex are the oogonia. Okay? So he here, if I just wrote it out, 
you have an oogonium, okay, and then it's going to go through mitosis to form a lot more of those, and then the, as they are forming, they specialize into the primary oocytes. Okay. Now, if you recall, over here, I'm going to draw this out uh, or write it out with the spermatogenesis. You remember you had spermatogonia, and it underwent mitosis to form primary spermatocytes. And the primary spermatocytes were the ones that went through meiosis, right? Okay. And this process did not start until puberty. So I'll put P-U-B, puberty, okay? And then it went on to completion. And you had the prim each primary spermatocyte went through meiosis part one to form two secondary spermatocytes. And they went through, each of those went through meiosis part two to form the f total of four spermatids, which are the immature sperm cells. And they just mature into the sperm cells. All right. Um, so you start off with a sp uh, one primary spermatocyte. As it goes through meiosis, you form four spermatids. Okay, well, in females... You have the same kinds of divisions, but the timing is very, very different. It begins before birth. So this is my abbreviation for before. Before birth, this process takes place to form all the primary oocytes that that female child will ever have in her life. It starts before birth. Okay, so all these little dots that you see on the ovary, those are going to be going through this process to form a bunch of primary oocytes. So if I drew a primary oocyte by itself, there it is. There's its nucleus. And then it's going to have a bunch of little cells around it that are called follicular cells. Okay. And so what you see here, now I'll draw it in red, there's a primary oocyte with the follicular cells around it. There's a primary oocyte with follicular cells. There's one with follicular cells. There's one with follicular cells. So these are called primordial follicles. And a female produces every one of those she's ever going to have before she's ever born. Okay? And she produces millions of them in the ovarian cortex. But they immediately start dying out, just being reabsorbed. And so by the time she's born... I think your book says she has about a million. But they're continuing to die out, to die out, to die out. See, they, they are halted at this point, at the primary oocyte. Whereas, unlike males, once there's a primary spermatocyte, it just keeps going. Okay. In females, it halts. Okay. Um, and so, by the time she's born, she only has a million or so prim primordial follicles. Okay, then... It just kind of stays like that. Most of them continue to die out, to die out. And then when she hits the age of puberty, meiosis starts. So, in other words, oogenesis continues at puberty. Okay, And then when it does, this primary oocyte divides to form two cells, just like a primary spermatocyte divided to form two cells. But one of the cells gets all the cytoplasm, the other is just there to take up that it, those half of the chromosomes. Okay, the one that doesn't get the cytoplasm is called a polar body. The one that does get all the cytoplasm is called a secondary oocyte. Okay, and so this is the meiosis part one, the prophase one, metaphase one, anaphase one, telophase one, and this process occurs. Let me draw it, write it over here. This process begins at puberty, but it's not every day. I can't spell puberty. You should be able to spell that word. Um, it's just one of these matures. One of these primordial fo primary follicles starts to mature. 
and usually the ovaries alternate and one of them has a follicle mature one month by meaning by maturing i mean it goes through the meiosis one and then the next month it's the next uh, one on the other ovary usually they alternate i think but for the most part only one matures a month in that female okay to form one secondary oocyte and a little polar body the purpose of the polar body is just to take up 23 of the chromosomes so that the oocyte the secondary oocyte will have the correct number okay all right and then it stops so you have a division and then it stops the division and then it stops okay as this secondary oocyte is forming through meiosis one let's take it up here here it is there's the secondary oocyte and let's just say there's a little polar body nucleus and it's just going to be absorbed but there's a bunch these follicular cells by this point it's not a primordial follicle it's what we call a primary follicle which simply means there's a lot more cells some of these have divided more don't worry about the difference in primordial and primary follicle you'll read both in your book okay but the primary follicle is the one that's actually now ready to go through meiosis one but anyway anyway as it as it goes through the meiosis one the follicular cells continue to divide so here they are and then some of them divide like this there's a whole bunch of them so that this little follicle now looks like this it's huge and in the this little part of it in that dark area I drew that's where the secondary oocyte is okay and it's not an egg but at some point this gets so large that it's going to rupture off the surface of the ovary and and this part of it which would be this which is a secondary oocyte plus some of the cells around it and there's a little membrane barrier there too but all of that is removed off the surface of the ovary hopefully to be picked up in a fallopian tube so that's what ovulation is I mentioned that in lab the other day okay. I know I'm repeating a lot of this from your lab but I want to make sure it gets in this recording okay. um, and then not all of you are in the lab so anyway so when a, a female ovulates once a month during the menstrual cycle that is a secondary oocyte that she's releasing not a mature egg it hasn't gone through meiosis 2 yet okay when it is released and goes into the fallopian tube then if let's if it encounters sperm cells so let's say here's the secondary oocyte and here's all the little cells around it there's a membrane barrier remember I said in the last lecture that the sperm cells have an enzyme in their acrosome that enzyme has to break down the little cells and the membranous barrier around the immature egg which is technically a secondary oocyte okay and so all of that has got to be broken down so that one little sperm cell can actually get in so let's say here's a sperm cell that's gotten in as soon as it penetrates that oocyte cells mem cell membrane then and only then does meiosis part two occur and again it's, it's similar in that one of the nuclei that's formed is a little polar body and it's just there to take up half the chromosomes you know now the chromosomes are getting out of that replicated state so it takes up half those chromatids okay and so now you have the ovum well ah. one cell gets keeps all the cytoplasm and that's the ovum and as soon as it's formed the little sperm nucleus is going to unite with it and now you have a zygote so it really doesn't stay an ovum very long a few <laughs> hours or so at the most okay all right and so you can see that you've got the same sequence of events you have the uh, ogonium going through mitosis to form the primary oocyte that goes through meiosis one to form secondary that goes through meiosis two to form the sex cell but the timing is very different and the cytoplasmic division is different okay um, and remember I said these primary follicles these primordial follicles are eventually you know they just disintegrate okay, eventually they're all used up and then there's not any more follicles to mature and at that point 
of a woman is going through menopause, and so she doesn't have any more follicles that can mature. Okay, so that's a why there's a limit to an age that a woman can be and still have children, because at some point her follicles have all, they're not there anymore, okay? which is a good thing. I wouldn't want a child at 60 years old. <laughs> What was your question? Okay, she asked, for those who don't naturally ovulate, they don't ever make a secondary oocyte. Somehow their their follicles aren't responding to the hormones from the pituitary. Um, and, you know, if they're all, everything's just going to be, dis, you know, eventually just, just disintegrated anyway. So um, towards it, later on in, in today's lecture, we'll go through that hormonal cycle see that a little bit okay so now if we go back in your notes so here you can see the primary oocyte going through the first meiotic division so you can see how the cytoplasmic division is is um, uneven in females so you've got a polar body takes up half the chromosomes and then here's the secondary oocyte okay so that's what's ovulated here's a little sperm cell once it gets in see there's its nucleus now the second meiotic division occurs, and then um, here you have the zygote. You know, so let's just say these are the the ones that stay, and then the others that I did not circle. Those chromosomes become these in in the polar body. Okay, and so then the sperm nucleus, its chromosomes unite with the existing ones ones that stay, and now you have a little zygote okay, with the correct number of 46 chromosomes. Okay. All right. Okay, so all of that is described in much fewer words in your notes, okay, but that's what all of this is saying. Okay, okay so this is showing you one of those mature follicles so here, I like this picture because here you can see one of the primary follicles. And so inside of this would be a primary oocyte. But then this one is a secondary. This is the mature follicle, and that's the secondary oocyte inside of it. And so when ovulation occurs, it's all of this that ruptures off the surface of the ovary. So that mature follicle is referred to as a graphion. That's not a typo. It's two A's together. And I've, I've always heard it say being pronounced graphion follicle. Okay. And I've mentioned to you that there's a bunch of cells around that secondary oocyte. Those follicular cells are referred to as the radiating crown of cells, the corona radiata, corona radiata, okay? And then the little membrane that's between them and the oocyte is the zona pellucida. So you need to name those parts. I've mentioned follicular cells in the membrane, but now they've got specific names. Okay. So all of that is released during ovulation. Okay, so that's the ovary. Now we're going to look at the other organs of the female reproductive tract, starting with the internal ones. Um, the fallopian tubes are what? that little secondary oocyte in its surrounding cells moves into, hopefully. Okay. Uh, it's also called a uterine tube or an oviduct. Usually the human name, the old human name is fallopian tube. But when a woman has her tubes tied, that's it. Okay. Um, so if we look at this, tell you what, let's go back to the sagittal view. You stay on your notes in that spot. All right, here's a fallopian tube, okay? And so do you see how it just sort of surrounds the, covers over the surface of the ovary? doesn't really connect to it. It sort of covers over the surface. And it's got these finger-like extensions of it called the fimbriae, and they're connected to um, a broad end of it called the infundibulum. So this part right in here would be the infundibulum. Here's the little fimbriae. And then there's the rest of the fallopian tube, okay, and, and it's lined with cilia. And so those cilia are beating 
like this to help draw that little, I'll say egg, but you know technically it's not an egg. It's an oocyte, a secondary oocyte draws that through. Okay, all right, and that's usually where fertilization takes place. Okay, between the egg and the sperm. The yes, egg and the sperm. All right, and so now here's the uterus or the womb, and of course that's what would uh, get my eraser going here. Here, that's what would house. Um, the embryo and fetus during gestation, during development. Um, the lower end of the uterus is called the cervix, so that's sometimes referred to as the neck of the uterus. Um, the wall of the uterus has three layers. The outer layer is the perimetrium. The thick muscle layer is the myometrium. And then the inner lining is the endometrium, okay? And that's a very significant part of the uterus we'll talk about later on uh, today. That's the part that has to nourish the little embryo, and that's what it implants into. And the whole menstrual cycle, the whole purpose of it is to get that thing thick so that a, if a little embryo is there, it can implant, okay? So we'll see that as we look at the menstrual cycle. Um, the cervix is the lower end. Cervix means neck. You know, the cervical vertebrae or the neck vertebrae. This is the neck of the uterus. Um, during pregnancy, the cervix stays very tightly closed. Okay, and because otherwise bacteria and other pathogens could get up through there and harm the developing baby. All right, so it stays tightly closed, but prior to birth, it's got to thin out. If you've had a baby yourself, you know the term for that. You've heard the term probably called effacement is the thinning of the cervix. And then it also has to open up, and that's dilating. So a lot of times you hear about a woman dilating. Oh, I've dilated two centimeters. She thinks she's going to have the baby that night. It takes usually a few weeks, you know, maybe a few days. Some people it's weeks of dilation. Bef it's got to be at 10 centimeters before it's time for the baby to be born. And the cervix has to be very thin at that point. But Okay, the next organ is the vagina or the birth canal. And uh, there you see right there. Notice that it's just posterior to this organ. What is that organ? The urethra. See how it comes from the bladder? That's the urethra. Here's the vagina. And then the rectum is just behind it. So you got one, two, three. Okay. Urinary, reproductive, digestive from front to back. Um, the upper part of the vagina where it comes up here around the sides of the cervix, that's called the fornix or the fornices. Um, and then the vaginal orifice right here, the opening, is just behind the urethral orifice. Okay. All right, and then um, the clitoris, that's some erectile tissue. That would be, its counterpart would be the penis in males. Uh, and it comes from the same embryonic tissue that the erectile tissue in males comes from. It's just under the influence of testosterone, it enlarges to become the penis. In the absence of testosterone and or the presence of estrogen, then it stays small. Still same number of nerve endings back, but that's the clitoris. Um, externally, the female reproductive organs are referred to, the external organs collectively are referred to as the vulva. And so the clitoris is, is part of that. And then also the labia, those are the two folds of skin on each side. Um, the labia minor is the inner fold. And so that's what encloses the end of the clitoris and the, the urethral orifice, the vaginal orifice, and then the labia minor major is lateral to that. Kay. The mons pubis, I didn't, I think that's in your notes. That's just this area, this fatty area in front of the pubic symphysis. Remember the pubic, pubic symphysis is the cartilage pad in between the two pubic bones. Okay. Okay. I think I've covered all of them. So we got, there's parts of the fallopian tube, and then, yeah, the uterus, the vagina. Um, 
Oh, here's a, here's a good picture, too, that you can see how it's all connected. And here you see all these ligaments that I'm not going to ask you to name. But some hold the ovary in place, some hold the fallopian tube, some hold the uterus. All right, but here's, here's the ovary, and then here's the fallopian tube. The broad end of it right there is the infundibulum, and then there's the little fimbria. Okay, they just sort of undulate around the surface of the ovary. Okay, you see the uterus and the vagina. And I have that sagittal picture again. I should have used that one. Sorry. Okay, and then there's the labia and the clitoris. Okay, so now we're going to look at um, the female hormones. Estrogen and progesterone produced mostly by the ovaries, but in females, the adrenal cortex also produces them. And in males and females, the placenta, when, when that baby is developing, the placenta can also produce some estrogen which is real important during pregnancy. Um, estrogen itself is responsible for the development of the female reproductive tract and the um, enlargement of all of the female organs um, early before the baby's born and then also um, at puberty, the enlargement of the female organs. And then both estrogen and progesterone play a major role in the menstrual cycle, which we'll see in a minute. And then uh, they both also function to develop the mammary glands. I didn't specify mammary glands, but it's, um, I should put that up here too. Mammary glands. I have it later in your notes when you look at the mammary glands. Okay. All right. Female secondary sex characteristics, uh, those are change a lot of the changes females go through at puberty other than dealing with their reproductive organs directly, like um, increase in body fat would be an example. Uh, breast enlargement would be an example. And so, when you look at this flow chart initially, it looks exactly like the one with the male reproductive system, doesn't it, at first? Because it all starts in the hypothalamus that produces gonadotropin-releasing hormone, which causes the anterior pituitary to produce the two gonadotropins, follicle-stimulating hormone. And then in males, the LH was referred to as interstitial cell-stimulating hormone, okay, but it's luteinizing hormone in females, but chemically it's the same thing. All right, and then those are the gonadotropins that in turn have target cells at the gonads. And now we're looking at the ovaries being the gonads and not the testes. So, And as the ovaries produce the estrogen, then that has a negative influence. It puts a break on this cascade of reactions. So this is all a negative feedback. Now, the hormone cycles in females uh, begin at puberty, just like in males. But instead of occurring daily for the rest of his life, they occur monthly until she gets to menopause. Okay, and then it changes quite a bit. Um, so we're going to look at this lovely topic of the menstrual cycle. Um, but it is very, very interesting. You know, at first glance, you think, ugh. But it, it's super interesting, though, when you, when you look at what's really going on. Um, your book takes a little bit different approach on describing the stages than your notes do. It's not that one's right or one's better than the other. It's just the way your notes are or the way I learned it, and it makes sense to me. And this is how you will be tested on it, is my way, okay? It's just the names are a little, everything is the same except maybe just the naming of, of different stages, okay? But it's, it's basically the same. And my way, there's four stages, okay? Uh, and I've listed them here, the follicle stage, ovulation stage, corpus luteum stage, and then the menstrual stage itself. Um, so I want you to stay on the pages that's listing all these stages. And we're going to go through that on this graph. And, but you got to get your bearings on this graph. Uh, first of all, at the very bottom, you see 28 days, don't you? Okay. So this is assuming a perfect 
28-day cycle, which usually doesn't exist, does it, ladies? <laughs> but let's pretend that it does. A perfect four-week cycle. Okay. And at the top, what you're seeing right here is over those 28 days, we're seeing the anterior pituitary hormone levels, the luteinizing and the follicle-stimulating hormones, so the gonadotropin levels, how they change over the course of the 28 days. At this point, we're seeing what's going on structurally in the ovary, okay? And we're seeing how a follicle, there's a follicle, one of those prim primary follicles, how it changes over the course of the 28 days, okay? And then in the third row, we're seeing the ovarian hormones, how their blood plasma levels change over the course of the 28 days. And then lastly, we're seeing the uterus, specifically the endometrium, the inner lining of the uterus, how it changes over the course of the 28 days, okay? So you got to get your bearings on this graph, and then we can go through the different stages. The first stage that's listed two slides before this is the follicle stage, and it occurs in the perfect cycle for 14 days, so two weeks, okay? And that's when, notice at the top, see how the follicle-stimulating hormone starts to go up? And as it goes up, it does what it says. It stimulates a follicle in the ovary, usually just one. Every now and then, more than one. So multiple births could occur if, if fertilization occurred. Um, but that follicle-stimulating hormone then, that's what actually causes a primary oocyte to go through meiosis one to form secondary oocyte, and, as the, and then the follicle matures. And so do you see how this follicle changes over the course of the first 14 days? And then as it changes, look at the estrogen level. Look how it starts to go up, especially towards the end. So that tells me that it's the maturing follicle that produces estrogen. Okay, Something about the follicle maturing causes the ovary to produce estrogen. And then look at the drop-down arrow from estrogen. Look at that. That means that it's estrogen that causes the endometrium. Look how little it is here. Do you see how now it starts getting thicker and more vascular and more glandular over the course of the twenty-eight of the first 14 days? Okay, and the whole purpose of that is if a baby is going to start forming, if a zygote forms, okay, you probably all know that a fetus is nourished by way of an organ called the placenta. It is a pregnancy organ. The placenta, part of its tissues are formed from the uterine wall, so from mama tissue, and the other part of the placental blood vessels form from the baby itself, from the fetal tissue. Okay, But it takes several weeks for the placenta to form after fertilization has occurred. But prior to those several weeks, that baby, that little early embryo and early fetus, has to get nourishment. It has to get oxygen. It has to get glucose. And it gets that through the blood vessels right there in the endometrium. So that's the whole reason the endometrium has to get thick. It's getting thick in preparation for a little embryo implanting. Okay? All right. And estrogen is the initial hormone that thickens the uterine lining, the endometrium. Okay, during this time, okay, we got estrogen, go back up here, follicle-stimulating hormone, let me do this in green here, follicle-stimulating hormones going up, luteinizing is also, but look towards the end of this, 14 days, see how you got this surge of luteinizing hormone? And what happens at that point? in the ovary as that luteinizing hormone goes up what what do you see happening to that follicle it burst like a blister it just pops and that's ovulation now we're at stage two ovulation which is like a one day event or just a hour or so event okay all right and so so it's thought that this surge of luteinizing hormone triggers ovulation 
And as soon as that follicle ruptures and ovulation occurs, look at the estrogen levels. Do you see how they start falling? See that? But now you see progesterone levels start going up, don't you? All right. So, right here. When ovulation occurs, this part, this part moves on over into the fallopian tube. What gets left behind is all this right here. Some of these outer follicular cells. And as they get left behind in the ovary, they form a, a they enlarge and form this yellowish mass. It gets bigger than this leads you to believe it to get this big compared to the follicle. But that yellowish mass is called the corpus luteum. And it gets big and then it starts getting small. And look at progesterone levels when it gets big. See how they go up? And as it starts getting small, they go down. And at this point, estrogen's going down. Okay? So it's still producing, as it gets big, it's still producing some estrogen, but it's especially producing progesterone. And look what progesterone does to the uterine lining. See how it makes it even more thick and vascular? Okay? And so this, this is called the corpus luteum stage, and it lasts about 14 days. So the follicle stage is 14 days, the corpus luteum stage is 14 days, and then just a few hour thing in between there is the ovulation, okay? All right, as the corpus luteum gets small, as the, that causes the hormone levels to drop, from the ovary, because it's this corpus luteum that's producing a lot of them, okay, the remains of the follicle. As these hormone levels drop when the corpus luteum gets small, look what happens to the uterine lining. So now we're after, after, see here's day 28, it's dropping, so now see how the uterine lining, it just breaks off and sheds, and that's the menstrual flow, which is the menstrual stage, which is overlapping, here you see it over here, it's overlapping the first few days of the next cycle's follicle stage, okay? For some people, it may be three days. For some people, it may be eight days, you know, and it's different with everybody as to how heavy the flow is. It depends on how thick and vascular the endometrium got to be, okay? So it's rarely, fairly complicated, isn't it? But the whole point is the thickening of the uterine lining in preparation for a baby, okay? Um, ovulation occurs right in the middle of all of that, okay? All right, and as we look at pregnancy, we're going to see how, how uh, the uterine lining is sustained during pregnancy because if it sheds during pregnancy, you lose the baby. But we're going to see, that. well, it's still doing that. We'll just move to the next slide. We'll come back to this one. Okay, so here you can see that a picture of what goes on with the follicle, um, with one follicle. Now, you got to realize it doesn't move around the ovary because these arrows mean time, over time. So this is over the course of that 28 days. You start off with this little primary follicle that here it is, here it is in uh, becoming the primary oocyte. So that's that meiosis one. Um, I mean, excuse me, it's, it's the uh, ogonium, uh, the follicle is starting to enlarge. So the primary follicle enlarges um, as it's becoming, there's a secondary oocyte right there. Okay, and then here's ovulation. And then what gets left behind is that corpus luteum. And as it eventually gets smaller, it becomes what we call a corpus albicans, which is kind of like little scar tissue. That's not in your notes. Don't worry about the term corpus albicans, but those are just old follicles okay, that had gone through the whole process. But look at the secondary oocyte during ovulation. Do you see how it's moving now into the fallopian tube? You see that? So hopefully it's just drawn up into the fallopian tube. Okay, let's look at this on a video. Probably explains it a lot better than I did. 
A primordial follicle consists of an oocyte surrounded by a single layer of squamous granulosa cells. A primordial follicle becomes a primary follicle as the granulosa cells become enlarged and cuboidal. The primary follicle enlarges and the granulosa cells form more than one layer. The zona pellucida forms around the oocyte. The structure is called a secondary follicle when fluid-filled vesicles develop among the granulosa cells and a well-developed capsule, or theca, becomes apparent around the granulosa cells. The theca possesses internal and external layers. The structure is called a mature follicle when the fluid-filled vesicles form a single antrum. At full maturity, the oocyte is located in the cumulus mass. During ovulation, the oocyte is released from the follicle, along with some surrounding granulosa cells of the cumulus mass, called the corona radiata. Following ovulation, the granulosa cells divide rapidly and enlarge to form the yellow corpus luteum. When the corpus luteum degenerates, it forms the white corpus albicans. Okay. In a female... The very first time, the hormones kick in and cause the follicle to mature. That's her the first menstrual cycle that she goes through. Um, as I mentioned to you, all those follicles that you're ever going to have were made before you're born. Okay, and they start disintegrating. Eventually, by the time she hits puberty, when everything's going to start functioning, um, you only have a few hundred thousand, not the millions you started off with. And eventually, you know, it do, the disintegrating doesn't stop at that point. They continue to disintegrate, and some are maturing. But eventually, you don't have very many left. And so, at some point, a woman might notice in her life that, oh, I had a menstrual cycle this month, but then the next month or so she doesn't, and then she has one. It just kind of gradually fizzles out, and that's what menopause is. Sometimes it's, it fizzles out all of a sudden, and sometimes it may take a couple of years for menstrual cycle to just totally stop. But the first menstrual cycle is the menarche, and then when they're all used up, that's menopause. W and the timing of that is different for every person, you know, usually around age 50. But it could be 30-something for some women. It could be on up into the 50s for some women. You know. um, now, when that happens, if we go back and look at the chart, if I can get all this erased this time, let's see. Okay. All right, let's look. Look at the hormone levels. Look at estrogen and progesterone. When those levels drop at the end of a normal menstrual cycle, that is the trigger for the hypothalamus to produce the gonadotropin-releasing hormone, which in turn tells the uh, anterior pituitary to produce the gonadotropins, and it starts all over again, right? Okay. If a person does not have any follicles to respond to these, these hormones, then... They're j those hormones are going to stay up and stay high because she's not making any more estrogen because she has no follicles to mature. And if, she, if the estrogen levels are down, that means these are going to stay high. See how it goes back and forth like that? In the menstrual cycle, it goes back and forth. When a woman doesn't produce any more estrogen, then she's producing a lot of gonadotropins. Okay? And some think that some of the the unpleasant symptoms of menopause, like hot flashes, might be due to the elevated gonadotropin levels. So some women take hormonal supplements after menopause, and they're getting enough estrogen to put a break on the formation of these. Okay. But, um, but there's controversy with that, because as you take estrogens longer and longer and longer, you you're more prone. They've seen some significant higher incidences of heart attacks and, and, and other fatal things. <laughs>
So, um, I did not talk about birth control with hormones. Let me back up and do that. I'm not testing you on any forms of birth control. You can read about all that in your book. But, but the reason hormonal birth control works the way it works is because it interferes with the hormone cycles. When a woman takes birth control, usually it's low doses of estrogen. And either in a pill or a patch, or now they have a shot, you know, but it's low doses of estrogen. And because the estrogen is there, it acts to prevent the hypothalamus from producing the releasing hormone. So that means she will not be producing these. And if she can't produce the gonadotropins, a follicle is not going to mature. And if it doesn't mature, she won't become pregnant. But a lot of women still have a menstrual flow with the birth control pills because there's still some estrogen in her blood. It's enough to turn off all the brain chemicals. But because it's estrogen, the uterus is going to respond by increasing its vascularization and thickness. Okay, and so she still may have a menstrual flow. Some women take birth control simply because they have really wicked menstrual cycles and cramping is involved and, all, and it helps to regulate them a little bit more but okay um okay pregnancy itself or fertilization is occurring right there around ovulation which is right in the middle of the menstrual cycle right in the, like day 14 um when fertilization occurs, usually it's within a fallopian tube. I thought I had a picture that showed this. Well, here we go. When, let's say, down here, there's the ovary, and it's ovulating, okay? And so now it's moving into the fallopian tube, and look at there, there's some sperm cells. And so if sperm are present, then the sperm nucleus, there you see it right there, is penetrates. And then now at this point, as soon as it gets in, the oocyte goes through biosis 2 to form a little egg nucleus and then another polar body. But the egg nucleus and the sperm nucleus unite. Now you have a zygote, okay, which is the first cell of the new offspring. Okay? And notice where that is. See how it's in the fallopian tube? And then that doesn't sit still. It starts going through mitosis to form two cells, like on day one. See, it's still in the fallopian tube. And by day two, those two cells have divided to form four cells. But these are all very undifferentiated cells. They have all the right chromosomes and the genes on those chromosomes. But none of them are specialized yet. These are those embryonic stem cells that you hear about. They're not specialized at all, to those uh, totipotent stem cells. Anyway, and then now you've got this little solid mass of cells that's referred to as a morula, which I consider uh, one of the pre-embryonic. I mean, it's human. It just doesn't look like an embryo yet. You know, it's just a little ball of undifferentiated cells. Notice where it is. You know, early on, it's still in the fallopian tube. This is a few days after fertilization. It's not going to, it's going to take it a few days to actually get to the uterus. But by that time, now look at it. So now the, cell, the cells, they're continuing to divide and divide. Notice how they're progressively getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Like this morula is pretty much the same size as the zygote. But the cells are smaller. It's just because there's no time in between divisions for the interphase growth to occur. Yeah. But anyway, now the cells are from the morula are going to, as they divide, they start moving and they migrate. So you've got some that are forming a ring around the others. Then you have this little mass right there. You've got a group of cells right here. But this is called a blastocyst. And this uh, is about a week after fertilization. It's at that stage. And this is the stage it's in when it starts to implant 
in the wall of the uterus. Okay, And so, this is cool, if you go back and look at that chart all over again, right here. Remember the blastocyst implants about a week after fertilization, which is the day or so around ovulation. And about a week after this, that'll put us right around here, right? And that's when the uterine line is, is the thickest and most vascular it will ever be. And so now it's prepared to sustain that little early embryo. So it implants in there. Okay. So, um, so here you see, there you see um, the little sperm. Here they're coming up. There's sperm cells. And hopefully the little egg will meet it. So you might wonder, okay, when in a menstrual cycle does fertilization, conception, actually take place? It's usually a couple of weeks after the last, the first day of the last menstrual flow, which is day one of the next cycle, right? So a couple of weeks after that is ovulation. So it occurs just those couple of days around ovulation. It doesn't occur at the moment of ovulation. Sperm cells may not even be there yet. Okay, So intercourse could occur on Tuesday. Sperm cells can survive three or four days before they die. So then ovulation could occur on Wednesday or Thursday and then fertilization. Or ovulation could occur on Tuesday and intercourse Wednesday. You know, the, the little oocyte can survive a day or so before it just disintegrates. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so we talked about all of those stages. All right. And then here you see uh, the burrowing in. See the little blastocyst. Now, as it starts burrowing, it's called a trophoblast. You know, that's not a unit. Don't worry about that. But if you ever took a course in embryology or had a unit of embryology, you would be naming all these little pre-embryonic stages before it ever looks like an embryo. It's very much, you know, a living being. You know, it's just not the full-fledged specialized embryo. This is the only part of all those cells that are actually going to become the baby. These cells out here become some of those membranes, you know, as they divide and specialize. You hear about the amniotic sac. That comes from these cells right here. The There's another one called the chorion. That's another sac around the baby that comes from those cells. So they're all from fetal cells. And then these cells are going to become part of the placenta as they divide and specialize. Other parts of the placenta come from the mother cells. And then this, this inner cell mass, as these cells start dividing and migra migrating, they're going to form ectodermal tissue, mesodermal tissue, endodermal tissue. Those are the embryonic tissues. There's three of them. When it looks like a little worm, that's what it looks like at that point. The outer layer of cells is ectoderm, and then the middle layer, all the middle cells is mesoderm, and the inner cells are the endoderm, and then a tube forms within the endoderm, and so the endodermal cells ultimately become the digestive tract, the urinary tract, the reproductive tract, the respiratory tract, all those tubes of the body. You know. The mesodermal cells, as they divide and specialize, ultimately become muscles and bones. And then the ectodermal, believe it or not, well, obviously becomes the skin, but believe it or not, also the nervous system. Because I mentioned, if you had me in a &P one that your uh, nervous system in the early embryo, just think about it being like a little worm, on the back of it, the dorsal part, that where the ectoderm is on the back, a little ditch forms. It's called a neural groove, and that closes over to form a neural tube, and all of the tissues around that becomes the brain and the spinal cord. Anyway, so it came from ectoderm. So it's real interesting. Embryology is a very interesting course. It's very technical. It's difficult. But um, it's real interesting. And in Chapter 23 of your book, a little you've got a little bit of a description of all of that. Not super detailed, but there's a little bit. You'll be tested just on what I've typed in your notes. Okay. All right. So what about hormones? We've talked about hormones when a woman's not pregnant. What about when she is pregnant? 
there's a lot of hormones going on then too. All right. Now we're going to go back to that. You know, we'll go back to that same menstrual chart. You can talk about a lot of this through that menstrual chart. Um, but it would be horrendous if after fertilization occurred, if the uterine lining broke down like it does during a normal menstrual cycle. Because then even if by that point, if the embryo has implanted, you're going to lose it if the uterine lining starts to break down. So you've got to have something during pregnancy to prevent the endometrium from breaking down. And remember, it's the corpus luteum. As long as it's going is up, the, in, the endometrium stays fixed. Remember, the corpus luteum is the remains of the follicle after ovulation. Okay, that little early embryo produces its own hormone called human chorionic gonadotropin, and that hormone keeps the corpus luteum big. And if it stays big, estrogen's going to still be there to keep the uterine lining intact so that you don't lose the embryo. Okay. Um, if by two or three months, the placenta has developed enough at that point to start producing its own estrogen and progesterone, which in turn will keep the uterine lining up. Okay. And so um, when a woman has the urine test for pregnancy, I think they're checking for the human chorionic gonadotropin. It, it starts being formed real early, real early. Okay. Um, during pregnancy, the placenta also produces a hormone called placental lactogen, and that hormone helps with breast development so that the woman can make adequate milk after the baby's born. All right, then the, the mother also produces excess aldosterone, which is a hormone that affects sodium and potassium levels. Remember, wherever sodium goes, water follows. So this is, this is the reason a lot of women struggle with water retention during pregnancy. Um, and then the, the pregnant woman also produces elevated parathyroid hormone, which increases her blood calcium level, which is critical because that baby gets calcium that it needs through the placenta. That calcium crosses the blood vessels at the placenta to get into the baby's bloodstream. And that baby needs a lot of calcium for its bone formation um, and for everything else calcium is needed for you know, in that baby. All right. Some women, um, if they don't get enough calcium, even though they have high parathyroid, maybe they don't have enough calcium in their diet, so that the parathyroid enhances the absorption of it, um, then her bone, the mother's bones might suffer. And she might, osteoclasts may come in and break down her bone to release calcium so the baby can get what it needs. Usually the baby gets what it needs, it needs but the mother may struggle some. Uh, some women have more dental issues during pregnancy because the teeth may be breaking down a little bit to give enough calcium for the baby. So that's why those pregnancy vitamins contain lots of calcium. <laughs> you know, but anyway. All right, so this is just a little flow chart that shows some of those hormones I just talked about. Okay, so this is interesting. Um, you may not know this. If you've had a baby, you probably do. But, you know, we all know about gestation, which is the length of time the baby is inside the mother, is, is nine months. All right, but when they count off the 40 weeks, it's really 40 weeks, they say, the perfect one. When they count it off, it really starts two weeks before fertilization. Did y'all know that? Those 40 weeks are actually starting the first day of her last, the beginning of her last menstrual flow which is the first day of that month's follicle stage. So what I've drawn on this little red line that you see right there, let's say that that's when fertilization actually occurred, which is two weeks after that cycle begins, right? Okay. And that's when this, there's the human chorionic gonadotropin. That's when it starts going up. And so by the time that baby implants, see there's enough of it there to keep the corpus luteum. 
and it still stays big, stays big, stays big until about two or three months as it starts dropping. Now, this is the placental estrogen and progesterone that's kicked in at that point. So this is all to keep the uterine lining intact. That's the whole point. Some women struggle with miscarriages. Sometimes it has to do with the hormonal deficiency. Sometimes it has to do with a structural um, abnormality of the uterine wall. Okay, then late in pregnancy, the woman, the mother, starts producing oxytocin. Oxytocin is a hormone like antidiuretic hormone in that it's a posterior pituitary hormone. Okay, that's, it has no function the same as antidiuretic. But, but one of its functions is to cause the uterine muscles, the myometrium, to contract. And so this is what triggers contraction, the labor in the mother. Uh, she might produce a little bit of oxytocin kind of late in pregnancy when it's not yet time for the baby to be born. So she may have some pre-labor contractions, and it's because of oxytocin. If a woman has labor-induced when she gets to the hospital, she's given a synthetic form of this hormone. It's called pitocin. They put it in a drip, you know, and that really gets the labor the uterus contracting okay so let's so now I'm uh, apologize that we're going to skip through all the process of labor and delivery but let's say it's all said and done the baby is out okay that uterus has had nine months to get really stretched so it's still pretty large but over the next several months it'll or several weeks it'll go back down ultimately into its original size about the size of a pear. And that process of it getting back to its small size is called involution. Involution. Okay. Okay, and this is um I just I've got these pictures on there, you know, uh I can't even remember if I talked about when we did the male reproductive system a vasectomy. But it's called vasectomy because it's cut through the vas deferens. And so here you can see it on the left. Um, it doesn't mean the man can't produce sperm. It's just here's the sperm, but they just can't go anywhere because it's tied off. Okay. Uh, but he still produces all the fluids, like from the seminal vesicles, the prostate, the bulbo urethral. So there's semen, there's the fluid component, but there's no sperm cells. Okay. Um, if a female has her tubes tied, it's the fallopian tubes. She's still releasing eggs, but the sperm just can't meet them. Okay, so that's fallopian tubes. Um, sometimes fertilization, I should back up to some other pictures because this is super interesting. We've got plenty of time, so um, let's see. Up here. Remember I said fertilization typically occurs in a fallopian tube? Okay. Every now and then, the little oocyte doesn't make its way into the fallopian tube. And it may just stay out here in the pelvic cavity. If the sperm cells survive long enough, you know, if, if there are sperm there, they could go here. Fertilization could occur out there. But the woman would probably never even know it because there's no endometrium to support that. And it's that little early embryo, so it's just going to be absorbed by the, just die. Um, every now and then you hear about something called an ectopic pregnancy. You ever heard of that? That's when the implantation occurs somewhere other than the endometrium. And most of the time that's within a fallopian tube. Sometimes the fallopian tube, it, it'll just... It'll implant in the fallopian tube, which that tube structurally cannot sustain the baby. You know, so it's that, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be crude, but that's a death sentence for the baby. It can't be sustained there. Um, it can't get large enough for it. It can't support it. A placenta can't develop there. Uh, and, and that can be a critical situation for the mother, so they will always surgically remove that little embryo at that point because it could cause it would cause the mother to die. Um, 
but that's what an ectopic pregnancy is. Sometimes you hear about a woman struggling with a condition called endometriosis. In endometriosis, remember the endometrium is the lining of the uterus? Sometimes other air other tissues besides uterine tissue respond to follicle stimulating and luteinizing or not those, excuse me, respond to the estrogen and progesterone by getting thick and vascular. And usually that would be like in a fallopian tube. And if it gets thick and vascular, then when estrogen and progesterone levels plummet, it's going to break down too, but it doesn't really have anywhere to go. And it's just that dead tissue just remaining there, which can lead to lots of infection and in pain. So, okay, so, um, but that's what, endometriosis is. One time, a long time ago, I read an article about an ectopic pregnancy that occurred on the outer wall of the lower large intestine. So evidently, fertilization occurred here, but it implanted on the outside of the intestine. And because there's room in there, evidently, it somehow a placenta type thing developed, but the baby was okay. And they surgically had to deliver the baby, of course. But so that was in Reader's Digest 30 years ago. I don't know how true it was, but it was in another country. But anyway, that's just a random, bizarre thing that just might happen someday. You might wonder about twins. There's so much that's not in your notes. It's so extremely interesting. So I just want to talk about it a little bit because we have time. But um, you've got maternal twins. Wh those are the identical twins. And then you have fraternal twins, which are the non-identical, which doesn't really have anything to do with mother and father, but maternal and fraternal. But if, if they're identical twins, that means their genetic makeup is the same. And so what happens is there's one zygote. But when it starts dividing into the two cells, four cells, eight cells, when it's in that, mo usually at the morula stage, where it's a little solid ball of cells, the morula just splits into two masses. So each one has all the same genetic makeup. And then they go on and to develop into two people. Okay. If it's non-identical twins, it could be two girls or two boys or a boy and a girl, but they're just like siblings. They just were developed at the same time. They have totally different genetic makeup. It's because two follicles matured at the same time, releasing two different secondary oocytes, each one being fertilized. Okay. You hear about conjoined twins, or the old bad name, politically incorrect name, is Siamese twins. And that's when it's identical, but that little morula didn't totally separate still held together. And so sometimes it's just a, a skin and muscle deal that holds it together, and that's easy to separate. Sometimes they actually share some organs, and then it's much more difficult. So you, hear, you ever heard of a parasitic twin? And that's when somehow the morula kind of separated, but not completely, but one just developed inside the other. And so sometimes people may think there's this tumor, and they go in, they look at it. It's not cancerous, but it's a mass of tissue that may have a tooth in it. Or, you know, it's just, that's a, anyway, it's rare, but it does happen. Okay. All right, and then, um, Mammary glands, of course, are very important in females to produce milk. Uh, if we look structurally at the mammary glands, the area right around the nipple is called the areola. That's how you say that, areola. And these are a type of sweat gland. They're apocrine-type sweat glands, or apocrine glands. But um, the mammary gland itself, the glandular part is what actually produces the milk, and then there's a duct portion that then leads to the nipple. And then there's adipose tissue, too, and the amounts of all of that vary with the woman, of course. But during pregnancy, 
if we look at, at the changes in the mammary glands during pregnancy, the whole change is to make sure that when the baby is born, the mother can actually make milk. Right? And so um, during pregnancy, the elevated estrogen levels uh, develop the fat, increase the fat content, and also the ducts of the mammary glands. And then progesterone works on the glands themselves, the part that's going to make milk. Um, I want to pull up our uh, chapter 13 notes and look at a chart real quickly on the anterior pituitary. Do you re recall that the anterior pituitary produced several hormones, all in turn controlled by a releasing hormone from the hypothalamus? One of the anterior pituitary hormones is prolactin. Okay, And so we had, you know, ACTH, growth hormone, luteinizing all. Prolactin is another one that we never really talked much about. But if you look at uh, this table right here, this chart, here's prolactin. Okay, Prolactin causes the mammary glands to produce milk. And like all of the other anterior hormones, prolactin will not be made unless there's a, oops, excuse me, unless there is a releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. Okay. And do you see that there's another hormone that has a negative effect? A negative effect on the release of prolactin? Okay. Everybody in this room today, male and female, unless you are actually nursing a baby during this, these few months, you are producing the inhibiting hormone. So that, thank goodness, you won't make prolactin, okay? The, so the only time, normally, the only time a person ever produces the prolactin-releasing hormone is right after a baby is born. And by that point, the mammary glands have been developed enough so that they can produce the milk under the influence of the prolactin. Okay. And so now if we go back to our... Go back to this. Okay, so so once the placenta has been delivered, okay, as soon as it's delivered, there's no placental estrogen or progesterone left. So those levels plummet, and that's a trigger now for the releasing hormone for prolactin to be released. So now prolactin is released and milk is made. Full-fledged milk doesn't really kick in until a couple of days after birth, but that baby initially is getting nourishment. And that, before it becomes full-fledged milk, is called colostrum. And it it's just doesn't have the fat content that milk has in it. It's very nourishing, though. Um, as soon as the baby actually nurses, the sucking on the nipples triggers the mother to produce oxytocin. Here's oxytocin again. Remember, it caused the uterus to contract prior to birth. After birth, what oxytocin does is cause the milk not to be made. Prolactin does that. But it, cause it, it causes it to go somewhere. It causes it to move into the duct. And the only way it's going to move into the duct is if the nipples are stimulated by the baby. Okay. Uh, some women say that their stomach hurts when they're nursing. Now tell me why. Because oxytocin is causing that uterus to contract. The involution, the uterus going down smaller, occurs more quickly in a woman who nurses than a woman who does not because it's exercising. Some women uh, have figured out that if they stimulate the nipples prior to the baby being born, that will trigger labor. Okay. Late in pregnancy if she's overdue, overdue, overdue. Okay. Because it will make oxytocin. No, it's just in the, that's a good question. It's in the, the milk is in the mammary glands. So it's being made in the mammary glands. If you've had a baby, you know this, they start engorging. And it's pretty painful. You want that milk to go somewhere. When you're nursing a baby, you know when it's time to nurse. 
and you're ready for that baby to nurse to relieve some of that pressure because this isn't going to go anywhere. If over time it, it never goes anywhere, it's just going to be absorbed by the body. Okay. And so, in other words, if the baby doesn't nurse, then it's all going to take care of itself. Okay, I think that's it. So I know I'm just kind of, we're just sort of leaving this hanging, but we've had a long semester, <laughs> and it's just time. Do you agree? All right, so that's it for A&P 2. <laughs>